So today's lecture, as I mentioned, is going to be about chapter 21, which is in the Ritmo section of Waves, the Ritmo book, which is the scientific dialogue. And the subtitle of chapter 21 is Brain and Mind. So obviously, as the subtitle indicates, this is going to be a chapter about how the brain works, how the mind works, and uh, a lot of other interesting concepts related to that. So I'm gonna share the screen now and we'll start. So this is chapter 21 here. It's around the middle of the book. It's uh, uh, in the second movement, uh, again, in the Ritmo section. Chapter 21, Brain and Mind. And it's right here in terms of the overall structure of the book. This is the melodio, the harmonio, and the ritmo here. So we start out, uh, and it's now 2 p.m. in the afternoon for Thomas. And he's had many students, of course. And um, his student this time is called Carter. And Carter is a very interesting student. He will actually appear later in the Melodio, uh, actually in the very last chapter. So uh, he's a very thoughtful student and uh, a good student. And he has a good exchange with Thomas, uh, the tutor. And he eventually becomes a doctor because remember these are pre-medical sort of uh, tutorials. And he will appear at the end of the melodio. So as I mentioned, the melodio, the harmonio, the ritmo are not entirely separate. There are some links between them. So as you probably saw in the ritmo chapters, there's a constant reference in a kind of rhythmic way, uh, denoting this ritmo, that the elevator door has a sound. And that elevator door signals to Thomas that there's a new student. So let's uh, just read this opening line from Ritmo. The elevator door clanked, just as we never truly know if tomorrow the dawn will rise, Thomas could not be sure that the echoing clang indisputably presaged the arrival of his next student, post hoc ergo propter hoc. Yet with a confluence of enough facts, one could depend upon certain things sunrise being one, and for Thomas, the clattering elevator, another. Light and sound, signals of ten tangible reality, foretold the future. So there is a lot of content in this paragraph. First of all, there's the concept of the sound of the elevator as a signal. The elevator is far away from Thomas's room, not too far, but it's, it's not next to it. He does not see the elevator, but he hears it. And that's a kind of signal. And that's a metaphor for the technology and science in waves, which is the concept of proteins uh, apart from each other could potentially influence each other over space. They have signals that they can go. So proteins don't have to just stick together to have their effect. They can have an effect over space. And that is what the elevator is signifying. Now, I apologize, there's a Latin here that uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc, that means that correlation is not causation. And all of you know this fact, every scientist knows this, every rational thinking person knows this. Just the fact that A and B happen at the same time or one after the other doesn't mean that A causes B. So correlation, the fact that they occur similarly in time does not mean that there's a causation, just like the elevator sound does not cause the student to show up. And this is related to a very important concept in philosophy, uh, most exemplified by David Hume, the Scottish philosopher, some of you may have heard about him, of skepticism. If you ask yourself, will the sun rise tomorrow? There is no mathematical proof. You don't know that it will rise tomorrow. It's just a pattern that we see. 
And this is the quote from David Hume, that the sun will not rise tomorrow is no less intelligible a proposition and implies no more contradiction than the affirmation that it will rise. So that is just, a, that's the ultimate in what we call skeptical philosophy. But Thomas says light and sound, signals of tangible reality, not just this abstract skepticism, foretold the future. So we can have some patterns. We get some signals. Maybe it's not 100%. We don't know for sure. What if uh, you know, the, the sun explodes and it doesn't, it could and the sunrise doesn't occur tomorrow. Uh, but we have some statistical basis, in many cases, often virtually 100% that we can foretold the future. Now, the other concept of this light and sound as a signal is again, the concept of the proteins uh, emitting a signal, interacting and uh, having a mutual influence. So this paragraph incorporates a lot of philosophy and a lot of references to the fundamental idea, but indirectly. And of course, being significant in this regard, there's a uh, quote from uh, Goethe's Faust, the bells toll now in fearful portent, tremors shake the wall to unbend, all unknowns have come to their end on my solemn hopes I do tend. So now let's go to the next paragraph. And Thomas is thinking about this correlation concept uh, and causation. And uh, this concept that we may not absolutely be sure that something will follow, but we have a very good prediction that it will follow uh, is embodied in the concept of what are called clinical triads. So let's read the passage such was also the sort of empirical probabilistic reasoning behind the notion of clinical triads. Three symptoms and or signs closely associated that strongly define or at least suggest a disease. While absolute surety in medicine, surety with medicine was illusory, a triad was nearly as certain as the sun rising each and every morning as it does in the Shah Nameh, always before and forevermore. Thomas pulled out a notebook in which were compiled all the triads he knew of. When Dr. C3, Dante's number, or two, the norms, triple, triple verdict determining destiny, Pythagorean noblesse, a light bulb switches on as sure as the awakening of a new dawn. So a couple of concepts here, he's referring of course to sunrise and dawn and the, this uh, extreme position of skepticism that uh, Hume talked about. And then there are all these numbers, Dante's numbers, the Norns triple, the Pythagorean numbers, and of course these clinical triads. So clinical triad, and this is just from Wikipedia, is a group of three signs or symptoms, as Thomas said, the result, or as the book said, the result of injury to three organs, which characterize a specific medical condition. The appearance of all three signs conjoined together points to the patient having the same medical condition or diagnosis. So we have here, uh, uh, let's pull up uh, all these triads. So for example, Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, has a triad. Um, infectious mononucleosis, uh, Riegler's triad, a, a combination of finding of the, an x-ray, uh, the triad consists of small bowel obstruction, a gallstone outside the gallbladder, and air in the bile ducts. So these are the clinical triads that uh, Thomas is referring to. So this is an interesting point. How is this the basis of AI? Artificial intelligence is essentially pattern recognition. You take big data and you see patterns. And of course, you don't just make a pattern on three things, that would be small data. You make a pattern based on thousands, millions of uh, data points, but we don't predict perfectly out of that pattern, just like the sunrise. So David Hume is right, AI is not perfect. But if you get enough data, enough points, you can get some predictions. 
And of course, before AI, doctors for many hundreds, thousands of years even, were using this concept of clinical triads, three data points. When they come together, statistically, they suggest very strongly a certain diagnosis. Of course, four data points, five data points, six are even better, but the human mind can't always think of all these points. The human mind is not a computer like an AI machine. So three is a kind of magic number. So, and so Thomas, knowing that the clock had struck two, that he had a student scheduled at two, and that the elevator door had opened, put two and two together and guessed, correctly so, that Carter had arrived. There was a knock at the door. Thomas knew that Carter wished to learn more about the brain. This he would oblige, but as Thomas rose from the desk, he resolved that this mindful tour would plumb the darkest of human evil reach back millions of years to the beginning of humanity and explore too the mysterious spell of music. They sat together at the table. So this is a discussion about human brain anatomy, a brain anatomy, but he will touch upon human evil, human history, and the mystery of music. So let's uh, explore that. So he begins the discussion by talking about epilepsy. Epilepsy is a disease of seizures of the, uh, the brain. Seizures are uh, uncontrolled activity, uh, electrical activity. And so uh, let's start and read. Uh, Thomas, yes, of course, why not cover both mind and brain? Applying the tangible reality of brain surgery to understanding consciousness. Yes, sounds good. Now, Dr. Penfield, who's a neuro neurosurgeon specialty, was epilepsy. Seizures, you know, are uncontrolled electrical discharges in the brain. Being synchronized, though, they are not entirely chaotic. You could say that the nerve cells have become communally deranged. At one time, epilepsy was regarded as a sort of religious experience, commonly associated with witches, devils, and all that. You know what happened? Burned at the stake, right? Yes, things have changed. And then he goes on about uh, pre-existing conditions and how people can be punished and so forth. Uh, and then he gives various famous epileptics over time, Pythagoras, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Isaac Newton, Carter adds, Van Gogh, Jonathan Swift, and Lewis Carroll too. Now, um, there's a phrase here, communally deranged. Communally means, of course, the, the, the group, the community, deranged uh, you know, craziness. So this kind of societal, this will hint at a kind of societal craziness. So this is an important concept. So they continue and uh, Thomas references Hippocrates, founder of Western medicine, who inspired Penfield's epilepsy studies. And Hippocrates, I'm not gonna go into the, read this passage, but he made two observations. First that there was a localization of function in the brain so that thought and feeling came from the brain. Uh, and the source of disease, the seizure focus was also localized, not just the whole brain, but some, in some cases, part of the brain. So one region of the brain was responsible for pain, another for joy, other areas could even imagine, one could even imagine other areas contemplate healing or say killing. Second, with localization of function, disease function in particular, brain operations could take out that dysfunctional portion. So in a footnote, Penfield was also intrigued by the philosophical aspect of medicine. So medicine has a moral dimension, not just about medical ethics, but about life in general. So it's very useful to learn about these things, but we're not gonna cover that obviously in this chapter, but that is a general theme of the book. Now, Thomas goes on to describe two types of seizures, partial seizures or focal seizures that are in only one part of the brain and generalized seizures. Penfield, as you might guess, focused on partial seizures because those are the ones that could be done some surgery on. Uh, and of these, there are two further subtypes, those with sensory or motor symptoms and those with psychic symptoms. 
Captain Miller, Saving Private Ryan, remember him? Carter questions, Tom Hanks, right? He died at the end of the movie. So you might wonder what is the movie Saving Private Ryan, some of you may have seen that, have to do with uh, this chapter and with the brain and mind in general. So let's watch this video. Find them, get them home. in Portsmouth when they brought us down for embarkation and comes and goes. Well, you may have to get yourself a new line of work. This one doesn't seem to agree with you anymore. Okay, that's near the beginning of the movie. You notice his hand is shaking. And many people talk about war and the stressful situation like this and shaking is being related to fear. But he's not, uh, you can see his face, he's not in fear. This is not the trembling with uh, fear. And additionally, fear is usually the whole body or both sides trembling. But this is just one hand and he notices it. And it came on new. He noticed it in Portsmouth. Now this is near the end. This is near the end of the movie. They're tank busters, sir. P 51s. Angels on our shoulders. What, sir? James. Ernest. So you saw Captain Miller's hand shaking. What's fascinating about the way this cinematography put it, you see the scene and it focuses on uh, Matt Damon's hand, uh, Private Ryan's hand, and it's not shaking. So to highlight that contrast, that this shaking is, is unique situation and obviously normal people and uh, you know that's not happening uh, with that kind of situation. So Thomas talks about this. So let's go through this quickly. Uh, yes, remember his right hand, it would shake. Carter, yes, yes I do. It was not fear that caused this tremor, no. No, if that were the case, then why not, why wouldn't both hands, his entire body for that matter, shake? Sounds like you're saying it was a seizure. Yes, in Miller's case, it was likely a focal seizure, more precisely a partial motor seizure. And I can tell you Carter precisely where his seizure focus was located, really. Yes, Captain Miller's problem was in the left side of his brain, the cerebral cortex, halfway up the central sulcus and just about a half centimeter in front of that. This is where you would have killed John H. Miller. This is what would have killed John H. Miller if he had survived Normandy. So if not in battle, what do you think might have killed him? Mm, don't know. Most doctors will associate a new onset focal seizure with an underlying brain tumor. This is what would have killed in the end, the captain, a brain tumor. Let's review his symptoms. It doesn't look like his trembling was uh, chronic because if you recall from the film, he would look at it strangely as if it were something he was not accustomed to. It would be safe to say then this was new onset. In fact, he mentioned that with Portsmouth. Carter says, right. Second, being in only one hand, it's focal, right? Yes. And third, he's an adult. Yep. Put these three together, new onset, focal seizure, adult, and there you have it, a likely brain tumor. And that's the clinical triad for uh, a brain tumor. Uh, in other words, if uh, an adult has a new onset 
partial seizure or focal seizure is likely to be a brain tumor. Of course, you'll do a CAT scan, MRI, and you'll study that, but uh, that is very concerning. That's the clinical trial for a brain tumor. So then he points out exactly where it is uh, in this spot here uh, on the left side of the brain because it's the right hand. So now we talk about the anatomy of the brain. I'm not going to read this whole section here, but he talks about the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. And uh, these grew very uh, large in human beings, the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. And he writes, the temporal frontal lobe then plans for the future. It includes the motor cortex where these plans get translated into actual movements. The frontal lobe is the lobe of the future. It is the planning cortex. And then he discusses the symptoms can include the patient experiencing phantom memories such as deja vu and phenomena. So the temporal lobe on the side is related to the past the apperception of the past. In fact, memories are stored in the hippocampus located deep within this lobe. The temporal then is the memory cortex. Frontal lobe is planning, temporal lobe is memory. Uh, that's right, don't forget, memory goes with emotion too. Both are associated with the temporal lobe. If you think about it, it's difficult to emote over the future. It's difficult to imagine a emotion in the future, even though we experience feelings in the present, emotions really relate to the past. Okay, so then we go to uh, a discussion of consciousness, which is very uh, philosophical, but obviously has a scientific basis. Consciousness also has a humanities basis and so forth. So this is really at the uh, boundary between many different areas. And they talk about Descartes and the so-called Cartesian cut, which separates mind and body. Uh, so Carter asks the Cartesian cut, right? And Thomas says, not quite. Here, reason or logos and spirit, thumos have a corporeal existence, namely frontal and temporal respectively. So it's a little bit uh, misinterpretation by Carter. He's not the perfect student, but that's okay. It's uh, uh, always for discussion. Uh, reason and spirit are both in the body, which is not what Descartes proposed. Ah, right. He, he corrects himself. Mind and body were separate. Yes, dualism. And there's a footnote about that, uh, which we won't discuss. But Descartes, much as I admire him, remember there's a chapter uh, subtitled Descartes, was clueless when it came to the brain. How is that? He believed the seat of consciousness was not in the brain, but in the pineal gland. What's that? It's a tiny organ deep, located deep within the brain, tucked in between the two halves. Descartes envisioned that this, the pineal, was responsible for consciousness. James Joyce, too adverse, mockingly perhaps, that the pineal was a glow with soul. That's strange. Why is that? Why the pineal? Thomas, cogito ergo sum which is a famous Latin phrase for I think, therefore I am. Ah, oh, that's Descartes too. Yes, the postulate of one mind implied an unpaired organ must be responsible for thought. That the brain had two halves was a problem for Descartes. Therefore, he reasoned that the soul must emanate from one thing and that he concluded, and that he concluded must be the solitary pineal. Though he convinced himself that this must be true, it turned out that this particular clear and distinct conclusion of his was decidedly false. There's a reference here to Descartes' way of thinking to have things very clear and so forth. But even though he was very clear and distinct in his thinking, he ultimately ended up with uh, the wrong conclusion. So then uh, Thomas expands on this frontal and temporal lobes and talks about human evolution. And this is one of the earliest uh, uh, humans. This is a uh, Homo sapiens. And Thomas asked, tell me, what looks to be the biggest difference between this? Well, the top of the head is different. Yes, the cranium, Australopithecus, the early human, was, you see, was pea brain, the brain of Homo sapiens. Us, that is, is much larger, but our brain isn't just generally enlarged. Over the course of evolution from Australopithecus afrenus to Homo sapiens, the frontal and temporal parts are those that became especially prominent. 
Oh, I can see that. You might say the humans, unlike animals, live not only in the present, but in the past temporal lobes in the future too. And Thomas says, that's a good point. It's relative, of course. Cats and dogs, for example, do not entirely lack frontal or temporal lobes, but generally you're right. We often associate reality with the present, but what I just said is now in the past. Living in the present is a very, very limited form of uh, reality. The past and future, I think you'll agree, are much richer. The downside is we have very little influence over those, but some power over the ephemeral now gone present. How strange is that? So then he continues to talk about this evolution, and this is a little bit uh, of a long section, but he points out uh, this is the evolutionary chart. And he says, the evolutionary tree shows the steps leaving the Homo sapiens, that's us on the right, all the Homo sapiens here, over two million years ago, Ergaster was one of the most supposedly peaceful, mostly herbiferous ancestors wandering the dusty Serengeti. What do you notice about the chart? Well, nothing special really. And he said around 1.4 million until perhaps 30,000 years ago, human evolution progressed in parallel. Two, even three hominid species apparently cohabited the African plain and beyond. A million years is a long time for evolution to work its effects on the mind, the mind that had to compete with other different minds. Another observation about our 100,000 years, our current species, Homo sapiens, overlapped in space and time with another species, Neanderthals. Think about it, Carter. Other people like you and me, not yet not quite like us, walking alongside in the same space, competing for the same resources. Do you think we cooperated? Carter says, probably not. So the point here is the extermination of the Neanderthals as a result of the uh, Homo sapiens. And that's of course uh, still an open point, but we, uh, Thomas, ref Thomas was referring to societal derangement. And in other parts of the book, as you read, he talks about Nazis and there's the whole subplot with Helga. And later on, there's references to genocide and. And that's of course related to the, the powerful technology that's being described and how people use terrible technology for terrible things. But it's kind of in our DNA that we have this um, uh, intrinsic almost uh, distrust or uh, even hatred for uh, people that are not like us. And it's built into the system. Uh, and of course, that uh, is why the subtitle to this is Hate Thy Neighbor, which of course, as you know, uh, one of the Ten Commandments in Christian religion is to love thy neighbor. But that whole religious aspect is a, a way of, has been a response perhaps to this very deep uh, uh, instinct for uh, protection and potentially destroying people outside our circle. Now you might say, oh, this is all very theoretical, but we saw the movie, this is a war, Germans and Americans uh, in combat. And you might say, well, those are just the, the soldiers, right? But let's look at Captain Miller. They go back to Captain Miller. He's a school teacher, right? Ah, yes, Pennsylvania was. Right, a soldier, he's also a soldier. And what are soldiers supposed to do? Kill the enemy, enemy soldiers. That's right, that's what soldiers do. With the sanction, even the encouragement of society, anybody, Nice school teacher, at least in theory, can become a soldier and thus a killer, even a school teacher. The spirit of Macbeth abounds. The witches are around and within. Call it communal derangement, a societal seizure. But there's good news. Hollywood always gives us good news. Captain Miller in the end was a good man. He no doubt taught battalions of grateful, some not so grateful high school students, and he saved Private Ryan. As we find out in the movie, Ryan, they went on to earn that life as Captain Miller wanted him to. A few more slides. Uh, then Thomas goes a little bit more into the anatomy of the brain and uh, not just the cerebral cortex, but the whole central nervous system. And he described the central nervous system from the bottom up of the spinal cord, the brain stem, the diencephalon and the telencephalon. Uh, the brainstem has the medulla, the, uh, the pons and the mesencephalon and the cerebellum. So um, 
there's a little more discussion around that. And then he moves uh, specifically with respect to the brain stem to a discussion of the cranial nerves. Cranial nerves are nerves that come out of the brain stem and he goes through all of those. And he points out that the olfactory nerve, cranial nerve one up in the nose, in fact, it's relevant to COVID because there have been some uh, ideas that uh, sense of smell is very much impacted by COVID. And that might be one way that it gets into the brain too, through the olfactory nerve. Anyway, the olfactory nerve, cranial nerve one, enters the brain directly into the telencephalon. Uh, in fact, it's the only nerve that really that goes directly into the upper part of the brain. Uh, the cranial nerve two, the optic nerve, uh, has a relay in the upper brainstem that goes into the uh, cerebral cortexes. So we often consider smell to be a primitive sense, bearing little information, uh, at least for humans. Dogs, of course, have you know very acute sense of smell, and many animals do. Uh, and Thomas goes on to say, it is ironic to consider that's the only sense that feeds directly into the brain's highest, higher thinking portion. The most primitive seems to have become the most refined. It's a kind of paradox. And then finally, he talks about cranial nerve eight. And he has a special feeling for cranial nerve eight, the vestibulocochlear nerve. And uh, I'll read uh, this a little bit because it's an important passage. We often think of the primary senses of sight, uh, hearing, smell, taste, and so forth. These are all with the cranial nerves. And these are separate, of course, from the other senses. But notice that sound sensations traveling with the eighth nerve so that's the acoustic nerve or vestibular cochlear nerve, enter into the central nervous system, the CNS via the rhomboencephalon. The vagus originates here too, as it works to control the basic and rhythmic functions of breathing and heart rate. Therefore, hearing situated near the lower brainstem is among the most evolutionarily ancient of the senses. It's a very ancient sense. Smell and sight are more recent phylogenetically speaking. Hearing is very deep, very basic, even more so it could be said than vision, taste, and smell. Only touch, which is the earliest uh, nervous systems, only touch is more elemental. Carter replies, I see, Thomas says, but hearing, if you think about it, about how it actually works, is just a highly specialized form of touch. How so? Hearing perceives the mechanical vibrations of sound transmitted through air as microscopically undulating touches upon the hair cells of the inner ear. The ear is really just a highly specialized and exquisitely sensitive touch sensor. So Carter, hearing is a way of touching through intervening space, another human being. Music is feeling then, not sound. And that's a famous quote from uh, a poet. I'll, I'll pull up the name. Uh, Wallace Stevens, excuse me. And Carter says, hmm, so hearing is just touch? Thomas, to a certain extent, yes, but sound perceptions don't remain in the brainstem. These sensations, call them highly modified touch, are transmitted upwards towards the temporal lobe, where these sounds are interpreted as listening. Temporal lobe is the lobe of the past, remember? Yes, so that means sound and memory are linked. And yes, emotion gets enmeshed among all these two. Right, sound and music evokes the deepest memories to the oldest, most elemental of the five senses, connecting the present with the past. Music, my friend, touches us and touches us very deeply. So of course, the purpose of this passage is to talk about the, the evolutionary development. And there's a footnote that goes into more detail that actually talks about how the hearing system is potentially related to this touch system. Um, so there's an anatomic knowledge there, but notice how hearing is just a way of touching through intervening space another human being. We talked about the proteins having their vibrations and their electromagnetic energies touching another protein, not through sound of course, but through electromagnetic radiation. So this concept here is a further reinforcement of the fundamental scientific idea 
in waves. And that's one reason why music is so important in the book, as you know. So he ends by talking about coma and ultimately another triad called Cushing's triad. So I'll finish off here. A coma was a clinical condition not falling under the schema of three. Two, not three circumstances give rise to coma. First, a diffuse dysfunction of both cerebral hemispheres, the brain's thinking part, and second, the failure of the brain stem's reticular activating system, the non-thinking part. So that sentence describes uh, the two parts of the brain as a summary that he talked about, the top thinking part and the brain stem and spinal cord, the non-thinking part. And of course, puts that in the context of coma. So in other words, uh, if you just have the thinking part out, but the brainstem uh, is functioning, then that would be, for example, uh, unconsciousness, but you're not in coma, you will wake up again and so forth. So, um, uh, so that's the definition of coma. And then Cushing's triad came to Thomas's mind, named after the American neurosurgeon Harvey Cushing, whose example the young medical student wished to follow. This triad of hypertension, bradycardia, and irregular respiration, so high blood pressure, low heart rate, and irregular breathing, was an accurate harbinger of imminent death. That single final state where all meet the holy triad, dualist, singular, or nil. And so that's a description of the final triad, if you will, Cushing's triad, which of course leads to uh, death. So that's uh, it for today's lecture on chapter 21, Ritmo, Brain and Mind. Uh, any questions?